Welcome back to the fourth in our series of videos on the internet. Okay, let's move on. We talked previously about the very first network that many believe was the beginning of the internet. That would be ARPANET. There are several applications that many of us use every day that were created during the period of the development of ARPANET. Those include email, file transfer protocol, and telnet. Of course, we're all familiar with email. What a terrific way to stay in touch. But are you just as familiar with file transfer protocol? This is a good time to think about a new definition. The one for the word protocol. In a nutshell, the word means rules. We often think of protocol in terms of social and political situations. There are protocols for the way two diplomats interact, for example. There's a protocol for how a gentleman delivers a lady back to her home. If you guys don't know that one, you may want to do a little research. And there are many protocols for the way two devices communicate over the Internet. First of all, the term Internet with a capital I refers to an international network of networks. Be sure to note that definition. FTP is one of many protocols used to communicate over the Internet. This one provides rules for the way two machines are able to transfer a file from one to another. That is the File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. We use it all the time, although we may not realize that, since FTP may be embedded in some website or another. Speaking of website, the World Wide Web is not the Internet. The web is just one of many different applications that reside over the Internet. And then there's Telnet. Telnet was the original remote access software created by ARPA. It allows one to connect from one host to another host and perform activities on the remote host as if one were actually connected directly to it. Telnet has fallen out of favor among most technical types in recent years for good reasons. It is a plain text interface, meaning that everything one types travels across the network in normal text. That also means that knowledgeable people who want to snoop the traffic can read the data as it passes across the network. That includes data like user IDs and passwords. Because of this, most use another application, SSH, or Secure Shell. SSH essentially performs the same function as Telnet, but the data is encrypted as it travels across the network. Encryption is a method of converting the text to something unrecognizable, unless one has an appropriate key to decrypt it. SSH was developed long after ARPANET. Speaking of the World Wide Web, here's its creator, Tim Berners-Lee. Mr. Lee coined the term World Wide Web in 1989. He created the first World Wide Web server. He called it HTTP. He also created the world's first web browser that he called World Wide Web with no spaces. Speaking of servers and browsers, we probably should mention a couple of other definitions. When we say web browser, we're talking about a software package that performs the function of a client in what is referred to as the client-server environment. The function of the client is normally to request data from a server and to format that data for the local screen. On the other hand, the server is a host that holds data and programs that may be requested by clients. The server's function is just that, to serve the data as requested. Here are a few more definitions we need to cover. Of course, we already know what the World Wide Web is. Hypertext Transfer Protocol is the protocol used between a World Wide Web client and a World Wide Web server for communicating and transferring data. You recall that I said that there were many protocols in use on the Internet. Now we've talked about just two, File Transfer Protocol and Hypertext Transfer Protocol.
The Uniform Resource Locator, URL, is a reference, an address, to a resource on the Internet. Let's take a look at one. There you go. HTTP colon, that HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, slash slash en dot example dot org slash wiki slash main underscore page dot htm. htm. That stands for Hypertext Markup Language, which is the original scripting language for the World Wide Web environment. Here's an example of a URL, www.mitchdavis.com. Ugly guy right there. Let's see what this one is. There you go. HTTPS colon slash slash umportal.umobile.edu, which is the address of our own course. By the way, HTTPS indicates that that is secure, that it is encrypted. The transmission between this website and you is encrypted. There are many programming languages available depending upon the application, but HTML was the first created specifically for the World Wide Web. Speaking of web browsers, here are several. As we've already discovered, World Wide Web with no spaces by Mr. Tim Berners-Lee was the first. Then came Mosaic. That browser was named Mosaic for its support of multiple internet protocols, such as FTP and others. Mosaic was created by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, at the University of Illinois, Urbana, Champaign, beginning in late 1992. NCSA released the browser in 1993 and officially discontinued development and support in 1997. Netscape Navigator was later developed by Netscape, which employed many of the original Mosaic authors. However, it deliberately shared no code with Mosaic. Netscape Navigator's code descendant is Mozilla Firefox. More than 20 years after Mosaic's introduction, the most popular contemporary browsers, Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari, and Mozilla Firefox, retain many of the characteristics of the original Mosaic graphical user interface, such as the URL bar, and the forward-back reload buttons, and the interactive experience. That information, by the way, is courtesy of Wikipedia, who I notice suggest a citation for that last sentence about all these browsers retaining mosaic characteristics. Actually, I'm reasonably sure the paragraph is correct having used all those web browsers myself. Now that I think about it though, I never actually used mosaic, so I really don't know what it looked like. Wikipedia could be correct in requesting that citation. Let's take a look at a couple of these web browsers. Here you see our own class website in Mozilla Firefox. Here you see our own class website in Google Chrome. Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox. Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome. Not a whole lot of difference, is there? Finally, we need to touch on the idea of addressing when it comes to the Internet. The Internet that international network of networks is actually made up of probably millions of hosts, including the one you're on right now. If you think about it, in order to be able to access any one of these millions of hosts, it's necessary that each have its own unique address. How could one access any single site if more than one had the same address? Now, we're not talking about the World Wide Web. We're talking about the Internet itself. Ultimately, the World Wide Web uses the same Internet address as all the other applications that use the network. The address we're talking about is the Internet Protocol address, IP address. This is the way it looks. Four octets. Generally speaking, no one is actually in charge of the Internet. Control is limited to the administration of the individual networks that compose this international network of networks. 
but no one entity has control over the global internet. However, there must be some control in order to ensure those unique addresses. That is the responsibility of the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. In order to get an address, an organization must apply to ICANN. Of course, individual users like ourselves are given an address by our Internet provider. By the way, that is also something important to know. Our access to the Internet is provided by some commercial entity referred to as the Internet Service Provider. The problem with IP addresses is that they're not easy to remember. Take a look at that number and think of all of the websites that you visit. How would you like to have to remember a number like that for all those websites? Fortunately, we don't have to because someone who recognized the problem that human beings don't remember numbers quite that well came along with the idea of the domain name system. This is a system that converts those IP addresses to names that we can remember. For the purposes of this course, we won't go into much detail about the system. There are, however, a number of general categories of names that have been created to help us organize the names as shown here. .com, .org, .edu, .mil, and so on. So now we can easily learn and remember a name like www.umobile.edu. Well, that does it for this series on the Internet. When you're satisfied that you have learned the material, you can take the quiz in the next portlet. Make sure that you've taken good notes. There's no reason why you cannot revisit some of these lectures to be sure that you have it covered. You really don't want to try and look back at the videos in the middle of the test. It might time out on you and you will not be able to take it again. Good luck on the quiz.